Um, you are right on time for Let's Talk Kansas City Physical Activity Plan with Dr. Robin Shook and Laura Steele from Biquat KC. Uh, we have um, a few different uh, groups and entities and organizations joining us tonight. We've got folks from Endless Outdoors. We've got uh, Children's Mercy. Um, we're expecting some folks from the Johnson County Department of Health and Environment, uh, as well as um, Walk WICO with Groundwork NRG. We're excited to have all our partners join us tonight for this really exciting and important program. I know that we, are, we all have a vested interest in keeping families and communities active and thriving. Um, and we're eager to hear what the KCPA core work group has to say about uh, the plan that they've come up with. Tonight's uh, session will be recorded. Um, and for right now, we're gonna keep you all muted. Uh, however, um, we would love for you to introduce yourself in the chat. Please feel free to ask lots of questions. Robin has a, a program to go through um, and he'll have a presentation and then we'll have lots of questions and discussion, including the questions that you submitted when you uh, registered for the, for the um, session. We'll talk about those throughout the program and also towards the end. So keep a listening ear out and uh, listen if your question is already answered. And if it's not, we will definitely try to get to it um, towards the end. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, I am going to pass it off to Eric Rogers, who is the Executive Director of IQUOT KC. Thank you, Liz, and welcome, everybody. It's great to have you here. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce um, our two speakers tonight. Um, the discussion this evening will be led by Laura Steele. Uh, she's by Kwa KC's Education Director, and in that role, she leads all of our adult and youth education programs, including our Safe Routes to School programs. Uh, Laura's been involved with the Kansas City Physical Activity Plan um, on the core team, and she's worked with Dr. Shook's team at Children's on several research projects in the last few years. And our guest of honor, uh, Dr. Robin Shook, is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Children's Mercy and at UMKC School of Medicine. And he's the director of Weighing In. Uh, his research interests center around public health and clinical approaches to understanding obesity. Uh, his clinical work focuses on energy balance, which is the interaction between diet activity level and body weight. Um, from these studies, he developed strategies to prevent or reduce obesity on a population level. Um, as the director of Weighing In at Children's Mercy, he seeks to align community programs addressing, addressing healthy lifestyles. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Shook is a board member here at Bike Walk AC, and we're grateful for his service. And so I will turn it over to Dr. Shook to go through his presentation, and then we'll have um, some follow-up discussion and questions uh, with Laura. So please take it away. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, I was telling someone once that I uh, was got to know some people from Bike Walk KC before I even moved to Kansas City and was impressed from afar with uh, the work that they've done uh, and are doing. And so um, I'm happy that I, now that I'm here and I've been here for a while, I can uh, really work with them on some, on some really um, important projects to uh, make Kansas City a better place to live. So um, let me pull up my slides real quick. Okay. So um, again, my name is Robin Shook. Uh, I work at Children's Mercy um, downtown. And one of the things that I do there is direct a program called Weighing In. And as Eric mentioned, uh, one thing or the, the thing that Weighing In is really good at is connecting all the different other organizations in the region who are doing work around healthy lifestyles and getting them to move collectively together, uh, whether that's around physical activity or healthy eating or anything else related to children's health. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, our, 
perhaps our biggest initiative, uh, which is the Kansas City Physical Activity Plan. Um, and I'm gonna get to the whole point of my presentation right off the bat. So you can leave in the next five minutes if you want. Um, why do we need a Kansas City Physical Activity Plan? Number one, physical activity is one of the most important determinants of someone's health. Number two, most residents who live in our region do not obtain sufficient levels of physical activity. So how do we address that? Well, there's not a single program or policy that can address the needs adequately. So instead we need collective action across all sectors of society if we want to make any positive change. And we feel that one good way to do that is through the Kansas City Physical Activity Plan. Uh, and that is because it's a multi-sector and collaborative approach to creating a culture of physical activity in our region. Now, throughout this presentation, I'm gonna use something called Mentimeter. I don't know if anyone's ever used this before, but it's very, very easy. Um, what you can do is either you can go uh, to menti.com and use the code that you see on the screen, or you can just pull out your phone and take a picture of that QR code and it'll take you directly to the Menti meter, okay? Um, so there's gonna be a couple times where I'm gonna cue you to go to that uh, Menti site and we'll do some kind of interactive activities here, okay? Um, all right, so starting off, uh, this is, a painting that I have hanging in my office. It's called Children's Games, um, and it's, it was painted by Peter Bruegel the Elder, uh, I swear that's his name, in, 15, in the year 1560. And uh, this is right by my computer, and so I look at it all day, every day, and seems like every time I look at it, I see something different. Uh, there's so much going on. There's so many different, uh, there's so much action in this, in this painting. And it really makes me think about a lot of different things. And I have different thoughts just about every single day when I uh, look at this painting. So we're gonna start off with a couple different Mentimeters right now. Um, so let me pull up my Mentimeter. Go ahead to menti.com, put in that code, and we're gonna start out with you telling us uh, how you would describe your role uh, tonight. So you're here watching this presentation. Uh, what do you consider yourself as you're sitting in the audience. Are you a teacher? Are you, do you work for a school as an administrator? Do you work in a health department? Do you work in a nonprofit? Are you a parent? Are you a coach? Are you a healthcare worker? Are you just someone who thought this was an interesting topic? Are you something else? And you can vote on this. I think you can vote three times. So go ahead, vote as many times as you would like. And we'll give it just another couple seconds to make sure everybody gets in, gets in their, their vote. And I'm even gonna go and put in mine. Okay, so we've got a lot of people, um, obviously, that are working at a nonprofit. So maybe by Park KC is, is well represented. Maybe there's some of my weighing in uh, fellow employees that are here. Um, then it's a nice mix otherwise. Lots of just people who are curious on the topic, um, several parents, uh, and then even a couple teachers and others. So um, now, Next question, 
what are some of your favorite places in Kansas City to be physically active? And this is just a free text option. So you can just type in, uh, this picture is from close to where I live and it is the trolley trail. So I get a lot of physical activity on the trolley trail. Pine Creek Trail, just in your neighborhood. Getting a nice mix. Not a lot of people going to the same places. Um, I think that that's probably uh, probably reflective of of uh, life, right? Um, we don't all go to um, the YMCA or or something. Um, obviously, a lot of things. Actually, these are all out outdoor activities. Um, no one has put something like going to their, their city gym or uh, YMCA. Lots of neighborhood though. Um, it looks like, you know, um, either walking in my neighborhood, my neighborhood, I live in the trolley trail, that's my neighborhood. Um, so good diversity in where we go and even maybe the types of activities that we're doing in these, these environments. Um, another question. Uh, what do you think is the most important issue in, and I'm going to call it active living uh, today? And active living can mean lots of different things. So it can be um, maybe in the built environment, uh, you know, uh, how you get to work, um, uh, maybe in your neighborhood. Um, I'm interested in children's health, so maybe sports. I think you can enter in, well, maybe as many times as you want. So you can keep putting things in there. And so this is a word cloud. So um, things that uh, are more important are appear a little larger. So maybe if you see something up there that someone else has posted, um, maybe you think you can enter in that same same word. So we've got several things here related to access, um, whether it's accessibility, access, um, access to sports opportunities, equity, inclusive activities, then kind of a mix of other things. Um, Confidence, safety, cultural acceptance, uh, health and safety is another one. And so we, we ask this question a lot in a lot of different forums. And um, we typically see responses like this where there's maybe access always seems to be one of the biggest. Um, and then it's a mix, um, a lot of different issues. Um, maybe depended on, you know, your lens, what you think your role is. If you're a parent, you might think one thing. If you're a teacher, you might think another. If you're a public health advocate, you might think of something else. Um, okay, um, good. Uh, last one, uh, and that's going to be getting back to this painting that I showed you that's hanging on, on above my um, above my computer. As I mentioned, I see this every day and I think of something different almost every time. And so what do you think when you see this painting? Um, 
And I think this is another, yeah, this is another free text option. And I'm gonna keep this painting up just for another uh, 20 seconds or so, and then I'll take it down and the uh, responses will pop up. Okay, so here are what the word cloud associated with this painting. A community was the number one. Um, Streets for people, people in streets, uh, free play, public space, everyday objects, that's kind of around free play, active gathering. I think that I've thought a lot of these different things. And, you know, I don't know if this scene was outside of. Uh, Peter's window when he painted it, and if this is something that was real, or if this is just something kind of like an ideal. But I think that we all see certainly lots of things that we like in this painting and that we wish our communities looked like. But the reality is this is not at all what, what Kansas City looks like, right? Uh, not a lot of playing in the streets, not a lot of free play, um, not a lot of uh, just large number of kids gathering to do activities on their own. So I, I don't know if there's any message behind this painting, but it just is something that can, can get us thinking anyway. Um, so one of the most interesting things, the first time I saw this painting was on the cover of The Lancet. The Lancet is one of the premier medical journals in the world. And in 2012, this was on the cover with of a special issue doted, devoted 100% to physical activity. And on the cover under the painting was the quote, in view of the prevalence, global reach and health effect of physical inactivity, the issue should be appropriately described as pandemic with far-reaching health, economic, environmental, and social consequences. And this was really kind of a turning point, I think, for a lot of people, uh, that such a prestigious medical journal would share this profound comment and devote an entire issue to physical inactivity and the lack of levels of appropriate physical activity uh, in the world, not just in our region, but in the world. And so that's a good place to start. It's easy to, um, as you're doing work around trying to get people to be more active, to think about um, creating um, ways for people to, 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 to move about the city in an easy and affordable way. Um, Maybe there's economic opportunities associated with physical activity and creating active lifestyles. Um, but for me, at the heart of it is that physical activity really is probably one of the most single important determinants of someone's health. And it, this figure is from really kind of combines lots of different topics, whether it's physical activity, which you see as MVPA um, in, in the brown there, uh, fitness level, which is, you know, the maximal amount of work people can do, um, or amount of time spent sitting. Uh, it really doesn't matter how you look at it. The results are the same. And it's amazing the depth and number of research articles going back literally a century describing the positive effects of physical activity. And most importantly is that most of the benefit is achieved from just doing a little bit of activity. So this is kind of a confusing figure, 
But um, okay, let me get my cursor up here. Whoops. So um, hopefully you can see that on this bottom axis, this is amount of time spent sitting or level of fitness or amount of physical activity people do. And the lowest level is here on the left. The highest level is on the right. And um, so someone who goes from 100% of their day sitting to 75% sitting is reflected right here on this axis. And so um, if you move, for example, going from 100% sitting to just 75% of your day sitting, that's a pretty small change, right? Or if you go from low fitness to not even moderate fitness, just not the lowest, or some level of physical activity, this is, I think, is about 20 minutes a day, you see benefits ranging from this is about a 10% reduction in mortality to 25% reduction in mortality. So just moving a little bit gets you a huge amount of benefit. So our goal as a public health practitioners interested in physical activity really is about getting people who do very little activity to just do a little bit more, not to get people to be marathoners or 100 mile bikers or anything like that. Just get them to do something. Now, this is a problem because most Kansas City residents do not obtain sufficient levels of physical activity. I'm gonna talk more about this grading uh, data in a little bit, but as you can see, the overall grade for physical activity for this is kids in our region is a C minus, okay? So that is not very good. So if physical activity is important, but we're not doing a good job as a region for being physically active, how do we change that? Well, the answer is there's not a single thing or program or policy that can address all of the needs. Instead, we need collective action across society, um, across all sectors of society to make a change. And so in the scientific literature, we use something called an ecological model. And what that does is it says that there are multiple levels of influence that determine someone's, a person's behavior. And it's often best to use an example. And so I'm just gonna use an example of let's picture, uh, let's say a seven-year-old white boy who lives in Kansas City. He, his physical activity level is determined by a combination of how he perceives the environment, what his um, neighborhood access and characteristics of his environment look like, and what types of policy environments does he live in. So for example, uh, let's just say he lives in Lenexa, Kansas, uh, and he lives in a, subdevel a, a subdevelopment, and, and uh, does he view his neighborhood as safe? Uh, is, the is it safe to go outside? Is there, uh, are there bullies? Are there dogs? Um, are there sidewalks? Is there a lot of traffic? Um, what about, that's his perception of things. What about what his neighborhood actually is? Um, what's the traffic light uh, like? Does he have lots of opportunities for physical activity inside his home? Um, does he have access to trails outside of his home? Does he have, what are his, what's the school environment like? Does he have a good PE teacher? Does he have regular PE? What type of policy does he live in? Um, what's the zoning around his neighborhood? Is, are the streets really connected or are they windy with lots of cul-de-sacs? Um, what types of parks and rec department does he have uh, in his community? What other types of uh, policies exist? Um, in his uh, city center, are you allowed to ride your bikes around the city center? Or are there policies saying, no, you have to walk your bike through this part of town. So 
you can easily start to see how all of these layers will determine his level of physical activity. And that's why we can't have a single program or policy to address all of his determinants of physical activity. Now, so that's a 70 year old white boy living in Lenexa, Kansas. What about a um, African-American grandmother living in Kansas City, Kansas? Are all of those things that I just talked about with the boy, his perception of the environment, his actual environment, his policy environment, how is that different? And how do those differences influence her physical activity level? What about an African-American living in Liberty, Missouri? How is that different? His perceived environment, his actual environment, his policy environment. As you can see, not only is this complex for a single person, it's complex when you talk about the diversity of a population in a region like Kansas City with lots of different types of living in uh, uh, municipalities, multiple states, this gets very, very hard. And as someone who does this for a living, sometimes I can get very, very discouraged. It can seem like this is a mountain too high and too steep to climb. But I think that there is a path forward. And so to kind of demonstrate that, I'm going to do one more Mentimeter poll. So let me just pull this up real quick. Okay, and so this is a bit of a detour, but bear with me. Since we just finished the Olympics, this is a question I'd like you to answer. Uh, what group earned the most medals in the Olympics, in the Tokyo Olympics? And here are the top five. And really, I just want to know what was number four. So number one was all the US athletes combined earned 113 medals. China was second with 88 medals. The Russian Olympic Committee earned 71 medals. Some group earned 66, and Great Britain earned 65. So does anyone know what number four might be? And I think this one's set up where all the answers will appear at the end after I, after I close voting. And I'll admit, this is a trick question. So I'll give you just a couple more seconds. All right, let's see how we did. Oh no, it didn't give the responses. I don't know what happened there. Um, does anybody want to, well, just, to keep to keep this moving, I'll just go straight to straight to straight to the answer. Number four, it was a trick question. It was the women from the United States of America. U.S. women won sixty six total medals, uh, so that's like sixty some percent of the total medals won by the entire U.S. Olympic. Team. 24 out of 39 golds that the United States won were won by women. That's 58.4%, I believe, or maybe 66 out of 13 was 58%. Uh, but that's up from, from recent years, uh, uh, from past Olympics, the highest ever. And I just happened to see this today. This is 
um, a plot of the medals won since 1900, modern Olympics, won by men and women. And obviously started off, men were winning basically every single medal. Somewhere around 1980, uh, the tide started to shift. And for the past three Olympics, the US women have won more medals than the US men. We're also sending a record number of women to the Olympics. Um, and again, this has changed over time, most certainly seems to be the most pronounced around 1980-ish, somewhere around there. This is not exclusive to the United States. Tokyo 2020 was the first ever gender balanced Olympic games in history. Um, how, why did this happen? Did this just naturally occur or did something occur that brought on this change? And I would argue that this has a direct line to Title IX. In 1972, uh, Title IX was signed into law by President Richard Nixon. It prohibits sex-based discrimi discrimination in any school or other educational program that receives federal money. This has wide ranging impacts. Specific to sports, in 1972, fewer than 30,000 women participated in college sports. 10 years ago, 10 years ago, it was six-fold higher, uh, 190,000 uh, females participated. It's easy to think about sports. I gave you the sports, uh, the sports numbers from the Olympics and here in college sports participation. Just think about how this change with the primarily impacted college athletics and college athletic participation and funding, it had upstream effects. So it increased the number of Olympians, it increased the number of professional female athletes and backstream effects. You now had to increase number of opportunities for high school, middle school, elementary girls. That created increases in leagues, other increases in opportunities for women. I think it has clear effects on sports, on obviously sports participation, but levels of physical activity. It has broader impacts too, because these things are part of a system. They're not in isolation. You can't address college sports without addressing the system with it, within its sits. And so in 1972, women earned 7% of law degrees and 9% of medical degrees. Now it's about 50%. Just amazing. On the 40th anniversary, Barack Obama said, from addressing inequality in math and science education to preventing sexual assault on campus to equal funding of athletic program, Title IX ensures equality for our young people in every aspect of their education. After this year's Olympics, Billie Jean King, the great Billie Jean King said that if you give girls and women the same investment, the same opportunity, the same access, their potential, like in all people, is unlimited. So I would argue that whenever I'm feeling down in the dumps, that change is possible, systemic change is possible, and Title IX is probably the single greatest physical activity intervention that has ever happened. And if we were able to do it uh, in the past 50 years, then we can do it again. And that is kind of my motivation. So I kind of alluded to this, that, that this exists, you know, sports participation in this context exists within a system. And you can't just address, you can't just try to fix sports participation. You've got to fix the system. And so this is exactly what I'm talking about with this ecological model. You can't just address one set of words a grouping of words on this model, you have to address it all. And that's where I think the Kansas City Physical Activity comes into play. Because the Kansas City Physical Activity Plan is a multi-sector approach to creating safe, 
and equitable opportunities to live a, a physically active lifestyle. And so when I talk about sectors, this is what I'm talking about. Um, we've identified 10 sectors uh, that we feel cover most of how we live our lives. Um, so taking your kid to the daycare, sending them to elementary, middle, high school, colleges, um, healthcare, public health, the pandemic has shown how, in, how integral public health is into our lives. Of course, the people in this uh, webinar like are probably the well understand the role of infrastructure in determining someone's physical activity. You've got to have recreational opportunities and sports opportunities. You've got to have parks that are safe and uh, easily accessible to people. A lot of us are, are um, have a lot of cultural value in our faith institutions, so that's important. Um, media and business certainly play a huge, huge role. And so the Kansas City Physical Activity Plan attempts to align all of these sectors in moving forward collectively. We base our work on the National Physical Activity Plan. National Physical Activity Plan uh, was started in 2010. It was updated about five years ago. It's probably gonna be updated again soon. The National Plan is a comprehensive set of policies, programs, and initiatives designed to increase physical activity in all sectors of, in all segments of the US population. The plan aims to offer, excuse me, to foster a natural culture that supports physically active lifestyles. I really like that last point, a culture of activity. It is the norm to be physically active. Now, one of the key principles of the national plan is adoption at the state level, the regional level, and the local level. And that's where we come in. So we're partnering directly with the national plan on our Kansas City physical activity plan. We are taking a grassroots approach regionally. That means that we're not the government, uh, we're not the uh, state health department. We are a group of organizations that are working to change the environments that we live in. And hopefully we create momentum that moves upstream. Um, at the same time, the national plan is working downstream. So they're working with federal policy and legislation to create, uh, uh, to foster a physically active culture. And hopefully all of those things will align in the middle. So our goal is to create Kansas City focus sector specific strategies and tactics that will foster a culture of physically active lifestyles. We want to make a collective statement that physical activity is a public health priority in our region. We are doing that by creating a multi-sector coalition. It's not just Bike Walk KC, it's just not just the people in spandex that are ride their bike on the weekends. Um, it is a collective effort that's making this uh, that's making this statement, and we want to ultimately create a framework for implementation. And so that means that anyone, whether it's us or whether it's some organization that we don't even know about, they can grab our plan and start implementing it on their own. We also have three overarching priorities. And that is increase local funding for physical activity initiatives, regular comprehensive surveillance of physical activity metrics, and regular reporting of those metrics in the form of a report card. We can't tell if we're making progress if we don't surveil what the environment currently is. So we have four guiding principles that we try to think of anytime we're doing our planning. One is we want equitable access to safe places for physical activity. We focus on evidence-based approaches as opposed to kind of feel good type things that may not have science supporting its efficacy. We want it to be community informed and it has to address the system that I was talking about, okay? So, um, 
We've been doing this for, it's coming on two years now. I'm gonna really talk about what we did in our first year um, and just a hint at what we're doing in our second year. So our first year was really a little bit more than a year. We started in October, 2019. We ended our first year in December, 2020. Over that period of time, we had 55 meetings. We had one physical activity summit, which was last September. Across all of those meetings, we engaged with 550 individuals. We, we did a whole bunch of uh, information gathering um, through a variety of different means. We included in that was five different surveys, but we did lots of things other than that as well. The result was the actual plan. So we released two versions of it last year, and I'll talk a little bit about what those versions are in just a minute. Um, we immediately saw success. Uh, we worked, thanks to the leadership of Bike Walk KC, uh, we were able to participate in the advocacy for Complete Streets Ordinance in Wyandotte County, Kansas. It was very powerful. I believe that we could write a letter saying that we've got all these organizations supporting this ordinance that was up for a vote and it passed unanimously. Um, we've also started implementation. And I don't think I'll have a lot of time to talk about that, um, uh, but maybe in the Q&A we can. So how does this work? Well, uh, the structure is my organization weighing in um, is considered the backbone organization. So we do like logistical things basically. We have a great team, Shelly Summer, Bryce Miller, we're also hiring two new full-time research assistants. If you wanna come work with us and do this cool work, contact me. The positions uh, will be posted any day now. Then we have our core work group. The core work group includes these great individuals. There's 17 total right now, and they provide strategic decision-making for the things that we do. They lead specific sectors, and they also are in charge of recruiting other people to participate in the, the um, planning process. And then we have the work groups themselves. So here are the sectors. I've showed them once already. We've identified 10. In the first year, just due to capacity issues, um, staff capacity issues, we did six. So we did the top, the ones that you see on top, the top five, and then parks and recreation on the second column. And you can see the individuals who were in the core work group and where they fit with each of the sectors. Um, so basically, we got content experts for each of the sectors to lead the sectors. And then Children's Mercy staff provided logistical support um, and other expertise in helping them. So First six were done in 2020, and then in 2021, we're now working on sport and mass media. Next year, we're gonna do the last two, which is uh, uh, business and public health. We've created three documents at this point. Um, the first is the report card that you see over here on the left. I'll talk about that in just a minute. The other two are the actual plan. Um, and uh, the one in the middle is the playbook. Here's a copy of the playbook right here. The playbook is like the Cliff Notes version of the plan. It is easy to read, a um, lot of very just high level basic strategies and tactics. This is designed to, um, if you just want to find something quickly or if you're trying to tell someone about what we do, the playbook is a great way to do that. The plan is a little bit longer. It's about 85 pages long. It's got information on the planning process, specific information about the tactics. I'll show you in a second what that looks like. Just to go back quickly to the report card, and I'm gonna just talk about this super quickly. All of these documents, first of all, can be found on the website that you see on that screen right there at the bottom of the screen. Um, and this is uh, the report card right here. Um, and so we identified using local data only, 
what the overall rates of physical activity were, and then key indicators. So sedentary behavior, active transportation, sports participation, things like that. Um, this is very, very helpful to communicate why we need to do this work. And um, the report has lots of additional detail in it. So um, just because we don't have a lot of time, I'm not gonna go into it, but it's got an overall grade, a data quality grade, and um, key findings and discussion and next steps. So if you're interested in that, go to the website and you can download the plan right there. Um, now getting, or excuse me, to the report card, getting to the actual plan. And this is kind of where I'm gonna finish on. Um, we've organized things around strategy and priority tactics. So strategies are broad approaches to promote physical activity and tactics are more specific things that can be done to support the strategy, okay? So here are the 22 strategies that were developed in the first six sectors in the first year. They're organized by sector, which are color coded. And each sector is a little bit different. Some had a couple, some had five. Um, it all depend on what the group determined they wanted for their strategies. I'm gonna show you in detail a couple of these in just a minute, but these are all available on our website. These are the cards that I was showing easy to read strategies. We also have a lot more information that I'm gonna just kind of skip over. Um, but if you look in the, in the full report, the full plan, there is pages and pages of information on how we got to this point, how, what the process was like, um, the strategies, the priorities, there are, um, things that are currently happening in each sector. There are things that organizations are already doing, and there are things that you can do right now to get involved if you're a parent or a partner, okay? And so I'll just kind of show you, because we're at Bike Walk KC, I'll show you the three strategies and the priorities that were come up for infrastructure. So, this is strategy eight, nine, and 10 of the 22 that we developed. Um, so the strategy eight is collect infrastructure data that better informs active transportation policy, equity, and supports future investments. And so then there were two, um, that's the strategy. Then there were two priorities, uh, priority tactics that they thought could accomplish strategy eight. And you know that's engaging, um, with neighborhood organizations to collect data that is representative and accessible to all communities. Uh, the second one was they should develop shared goals and metrics to track the progress. Strategy nine was about linking with public health and developing incentives to, re to reward active transportation. There were three priorities that were developed to support that strategy. Last one was strategy 10. Um, that was engaging with community planners to use active design in land use, transportation, and economic development. So uh, the one that I like was priority number two, creating safe opportunities by connecting vacant lots, infrastructure maintenance, and road safety to create beautiful spaces to walk within neighborhoods. A lot of us, we in the Mentimeter said we get a lot of our activity in neighborhoods. This makes a lot of sense. So how can you get involved and what are the next steps? Well, there are lots of different ways. Um, going to our website is by far the best way to connect with us. There's lots of ways you can sign up, join a newsletter, things like that. Um, I'm going to show you when our upcoming meetings are on the next slide. We are actively planning for sport and media right now. So you can hop on with the uh, development process right now. If you want to join the business and public health sectors, those start next year. Uh, you can contact us now and we'll put you on our list. You can contact us on our website. 
Here's a couple email addresses. Here's my personal email address if you want to just reach out to me directly. Um, and this is a living document. We're going to continue to update this as needed and definitely at regular intervals. Um, here are our upcoming meetings just over the next uh, four weeks or so. So we've got meetings for the early childhood sector, the sports sector, uh, the school sector, um, healthcare, uh, the physical activity and parks, uh, excuse me, the parks and infrastructure group have kind of combined. Their meeting is, they just had one. So their next one will be in September. And then weighing in the larger organization, we've got our quarterly meeting uh, on Thursday, September 9th. All of this information is on our website. We try to make it easy for you. Um, so with that, uh, I've talked a long time, so I'm gonna open it up for questions. Uh, hopefully I answered a lot of questions throughout the presentation. Um, so thank you very much and uh, let's have at it. Yeah, Dr. Shook, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I really want to make sure to leave time to prioritize any questions from the audience. We have some that came through with the Eventbrite registration, but um, everybody is welcome to place any questions they have uh, in the chat, and we'll pick those up and, and answer those. Um, but I think to kind of just really quickly start us off, um, you know, um, you mentioned that the national plan has kind of a schedule of updating itself five-ish or so years, every five-ish. So what do you think um, and envision the process and frequency for updating the Kansas City Pacific plan to be? It's a great question. My, um, we have tentatively planned on a formal uh, revision every five years, very similar to the national plan. However, we're quickly finding that um, you know, when you start something new, it's always hard to convince people to participate because you don't know if it's going to be worth your time or effort. And so we've had a lot of people now that we've gone through a year and a half of this say, hey, wait a minute, I wasn't able to participate in the first year, but I want to add something now. And so I think that it makes a lot of sense that we might do some uh, kind of unofficial revisions before the five-year period, especially when it makes a lot of sense. Awesome. Um, can you kind of describe, you know, maybe some of the innovative approaches that you're seeing um, that are being brought to the table by core work group members or their work groups um, to increase levels of physical activity? Well, the one that first comes to mind um, is the work that you've been working on um, with uh, partnering with central middle school students to do, um, if, you're not, if you're familiar with central middle school in Kansas City, right across the street is Central Park. It's a nice big park. There's a football stadium there. There's tennis courts. There's other playground equipment. It's also separated by a couple very, very busy roads. And um, to get there can not necessarily be easy if you're a middle, middle school student. And so uh, you and um, Dr. Amanda Grimes from UMKC have done a great job of engaging those middle schoolers in assessing the environment around the school and the park and um, figuring out what might be some good ways to address some of the where improvements could be made with city officials and then doing pop-up demonstrations uh, to showcase what those changes might look like. And I think that that's a very innovative approach that, Im that involves multiple sectors, in this case, schools um, and the built environment uh, and policymakers to do built environment change. That's a great, a great example. Thank you. So we do have a question from the chat. Um, so what level of participation have you had with uh, elected officials? 
Um, how can we encourage our local elected officials to support and implement this plan? This is uh, another great question. So we are um, somewhat methodically trying to engage with uh, city council officials. Um, we've interacted with several from the Kansas City, Missouri side. Um, as I mentioned in November, we interacted with um, the unified government of Wyandotte County um, for the complete streets ordinance. Um, and we we're doing some other outreach to some other elected officials. But we all know if you've ever been involved in this type of work, elected officials always have something on their plate. And so it's a constant process to engage them. And so uh, what we try to do is to be very specific in what we're asking. So again, just going back to the example that I just mentioned that you're involved with connecting with, in this case, it's not necessarily elected officials, but Kansas City, Missouri public works departments um, to, uh, to try to engage them in uh, changes to the inbuilt environment to make it safer for the kids to walk across the street. Uh, that's a great way to engage with uh, people either who are elected officials or who work on behalf of elected officials. And I just want to remind everybody, if you do have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, and I'm going to close out with one more question that I had. Um, you know, are you aware of any other cities who are taking this initiative and creating their own physical activity plan? Yes, is the short answer, but not many is the slightly more detailed answer. San Antonio is probably the most famous. Um, they've got a really nice physical activity plan. However, um, most of this work is driven uh, by health departments, which occur like at the state level. So there are several other state plans. Uh, we are the only physical activity plan that is not affiliated with a state or local health department, meaning run by those. And we've chosen to do that um, because we think it's potentially more sustainable. We all know how administrations and funding to public health departments varies a lot uh, over time. And so these plans we've seen wax and wane depend on the funding and interest of policymakers. So that's why we like partnering with organizations who have this embedded within their mission. So we think it's this is more long lasting. Awesome, very good. Uh, I'll just, well, just one comment because I know we're out of time. We are happy to uh, communicate this to any other organizations that are interested in hearing about our work, either in a forum like this or in a one-on-one -on -one setting with a phone call. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us. Dr. Shook, thank you so much. Again, that presentation was wonderful. Um, love to have everybody here again. If if you have further questions, um, we provided some links in the chat to be able to connect and um, reach and read and access things like the, the physical activity plan and the playbook and the report card. I'm going to now hand it over to Liz to kind of close us out. Thank you very much, Dr. Shuck, and thank you, Laura. Uh, I would like to say that I am leaving this uh, session, this little webinar, very hopeful. I think that many hands make light work and it is really exciting to see such a uh, diverse cross-section of the Kansas City region coming together for a common purpose. And I love, love, love uh, how you um, thought about where we all spend our time and how we live our lives. And that's where you gather these sectors from. Because I think that uh, as, um, as broad experiences we have uh, as individuals living here in the region, we all have these things in common, right? Whatever they are. So thank you so much um, for doing the work and thank you for sharing the work with us. I'd like to thank everyone who attended tonight. These uh, virtual talks are brought to you by Biquat KC members and our friends and our sponsors. We deeply appreciate your support um, and we appreciate your support, support as we continue to work together 
with many partners uh, to foster a culture of active living throughout our community. Thank you so much. I will follow up tomorrow with an email that will include uh, some of these details and links. And um, if you have any questions, you can send them to info at bikewalkkc.org and I will try to get to those and include those in the email before I send that out. Thanks so much for joining us tonight and have a good evening.